Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody in between, welcome yet again to another episode of the Sinshot Podcast, 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 whatever. I am, of course, the Mighty Pong. And I am Forge. See, there she is, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, we tonight are going to be talking about 3D printing with weird stuff, weird, wild stuff. No one will understand that reference. I, I do not understand that reference, so oh, continue. Yeah, there we go. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Johnny Carson, by the way. But at any rate, uh, so before we get into that, oh, we're going to talk. We're, oh, that's right. We're going to be talking about printing with wood. We're going to be talking about printing with metal. We're going to be talking about printing with VHS tapes. Also, is your 3D printer trying to kill you? The answer is no. But <laughs> it may surprise you what some people are saying about that. All right. But at any rate, before we get into all that, I just wanted to uh, uh, give you a quick announcement on the shop. Now, the Sin Shop is, of course, a uh, maker slash hacker space located in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, but we are currently closed for renovation. So you're going to have to wait just a little bit to come check out the shop. And uh, we would like to remind you, though, that while we are closed to the public, if you're in a shared space elsewhere, please make sure you wear your mask and clean tools, surfaces, and material before and after you use them. Now, to stay updated on the shop's open status, be sure to check out sinshop.org. Uh, to find the latest information and to make sure you're notified of our future events, including virtual ones, just like this one, you can join us at meetup.com forward slash sin shop. And with that in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, the captain's chair tonight, we've got Forge. man. I'm on a stool. I wish I had a captain's chair. Dang on the captain's stool. <laughs> I think chair was better. I don't know. Chair was better. <laughs> chair was better. Yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah. So Forge, uh, you at the sin shop, what, tell us a little bit about what you do at the shop. So I've been a member of the, the sin shop for a good many years. Um, and I started working on primarily laser cutting. Um, so I learned a lot of, you know, digital design through that and, and slowly over time have evolved over. I've used the big six by foot shop bot CNC machine. Um, but also naturally, 3D printing. So I've I've used um, a lot of FDM filament based printers, um, but I also used to work for a company that made SLA printers. I've used DLP. Um, I've been to a number of 3D printing trade shows. So I've I've got bits and pieces about the the additive manufacturing industry as a whole. That's awesome. That's awesome. So so okay. So we're gonna get into let's see the uh, okay. So first of all, I guess let's cover like the less weird stuff, the stuff that, that people probably do know about. I think it's it's probably no secret by this point, right, that you can 3D print metal. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that's, you know, a huge question that, that people have because, you know, as, as far as like, okay, 3D printing plastic trinkets, great, you know, that's, it's cool and all, but how how can I apply this, especially for people in like engineering fields? That's what they're interested in, which I've never gotten to touch one. They are way above my my price range for anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I saw some of those at uh, at CES, and and you had to have two different machines, if I remember right. You had one that would lay down the filament, and then you had to have a center like that would just heat heat it up, stupid hot, uh, in order to get it uh, uh to actually melt together, right? Mm -hmm. It it depends on you know metal 3D printing. Of course, I haven't had my hands on experience on it, but I know a lot of them are SLS printers, so selective laser sintering. Mm -hmm. If you've ever seen how powder printers work, is they'll lay a sheet of powder and then they'll they'll center certain spots, which will fuse those together, and then lay another layer of powder on it and then center other spots. Yeah. So when it's done, you kind of you take a brush and, you know, archaeology excavate it out, <laughs> which is awesome. great because you don't need, you don't need a uh, supports in that case. You've got all this loose powder holding stuff up. Um, but there of course are other ways that people are innovating metal printing. Um, I forget the company that does it, but they, they have more of a filament based um, product where, you know, it's got particles of metal in there and you've got some, some like plastic, or other material, um, but you print the object as usual, but you have to print it at a certain scale and you send it back to them and they essentially burn it out and it constrict itself until you have wholly the metal product. So hmm. a few different ways to do it, but you so know, up on the technology. screen right now, this is an example of what you're talking about, right? This is, this would be laser centering like on a powder bed, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. So, so you they, see the little pusher filling, filling over it. And then you've, you've just centered just the model parts. That's so cool. And now, now all the stuff that's over here, like E right here, 
uh, you can use reuse all that stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Usually, yeah. like vacuum that up and <laughs> and throw it right back in. Yeah, I would assume so. I, I would maybe who knows? Maybe you have to filter it. Never touch the stuff, but yeah, there's there's <laughs> yeah. no reason I could see that you can't. <laughs> So I don't see this method of, of printing that much. Do you, do you know why? Is it just, just horrendously expensive or, or why? Is they, that? they are much more expensive. Um, you know, you've got, you're, you're now centering stuff. I know there's been like, I, I remember when I worked back with a laser company, someone tried to try to center that material. They bought it and like, I mean, it made some horrid smells. It probably wasn't great for us. Um, but there, there's definitely like some more fine tuning than, you know, getting a very cheap off the shelf motor and a very cheap off the shelf, like heater and, you know, feeding those together, like, mm -hmm. like FFF printing has become, um, I know that a number of years ago, form labs ended up coming out with, I believe a, you know, like a desktop version of a powder, uh, CNC or SLS machine. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that was, you know, revolutionary because it was so cheap at like $10,000. So the, the price point is still high. It's still not, th this type of application is not necessarily what a, a commercial, you know, home hobbyist user is going to be using. Yeah. So I don't think there's that much incentive for it to be, you know, coming down in prices drastically. Plus, you know, the mechanics are different. Yeah. Yeah. Um... And I, I, I'm, I don't, I mean, I, Forge's voice sounds deep, according to... Uh, oh, no, is the microphone doing... Why is it only this microphone? It sounds fine in the playback in my ear. I mean, the, yeah, it doesn't sound bad. I mean, it's, it's, it is deeper than normal. It's just, you know, God bless. But, um, so, so that's kind of it, isn't it, though? Like, it, it really is cost that kind of drives what... 3D printer the majority of people use, isn't it? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, so once you get into, you know, companies that are engineering, yeah, you're you're finding what fits your application. Um, but if you're doing 3D printing for the art of 3D printing, yeah, you're probably going to start with with a filament based machine. You know, it's just so so widely available, so cheap to to print parts. That's right. the thing when you get to stuff like this, the material itself does get more expensive. Interesting. Okay. So for a build that, I mean, that, that the head that they're putting, you know, printing there looks to me to be probably about three to four inches tall and probably about two to three inches wide somewhere in that general, well, probably a little bit more, three, three to four inches wide. Uh, but um, in, in a situation like that, how much more do you think the cost would be for powder versus filament just to give some kind of like rough thumbnail sketch of like, I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you, I don't know what the going rate for, you know, powder based material is. Yeah. Um, but you also have to consider that, you know, there's a bunch of companies that exclusively sell filament while something like this for, for all we know, like the range that the laser can affect might be proprietary. And, you know, that comes with a lot of cost, even in the filament market. Yeah. Um, but also if you look at something like this, obviously you're pushing a layer of material over the top, right. you are having a completely solid filled model every single time. Oh, so yeah. That's another another cost. A lot of the the reason that filament can be so cheap is that you can print really big things, and you know you're using only twenty percent of the material on the inside. Right. Right. Okay. Wow. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, like, one of the things that I've been hearing for a, for a really long time is that, um, especially metal printing, but just three D printing, just in, in as a whole, is you know, oh, that's fine for for a prototype. But, you know, it's, it's not really going to be used much for production. And I found out uh, earlier today that Ford has just opened a... Uh, hey, Zenify, just resubscribe. Thank you so much. We appreciate it, man. Thank you for, for giving us some of Jeff Bezos' money. We, we really <laughs> appreciate that. Um, just a little bit. Oh, here, we got we to thank you in the, in, the, in the chat there. Boom. There thank you go. You for the, <laughs> thank you for the 2020 glitchy. I'm not sure what a 2020 glitchy is. It looks like that. That's what it is. We are now the proud possessors of 2020 glitchies. Um, so, uh, yeah, but so Ford just opened an additive manufacturing. Uh, 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 there you go. Thanks for the, wow, what is that? Oh, 2020 Celebrate. Man, we got 2020 stuff coming out of our ears. That's awesome. Wow. Wow. 
Uh, okay, so, uh, yeah, so Porsche. They're not only using it for prototyping, but also on-demand parts as well. So I did a little bit, uh, a little bit digging into that today, and I found this article on 3ERP.com, and uh, basically what they were talking about was uh, a different, and we're going to have a link to this in the, uh, in the YouTube video. In fact, here, you know what? Um, I'll cut this part out later, but let me, let me dump that in the chat, so if you guys want to check it out, you can. We're going to go over here, copy, over here, paste. But yeah, here's a, uh, this is a link from uh, 3ERP mag uh, uh, magazine or whatever, dot com. Uh, and their blog was talking about five different manufacturers, uh, major auto manufacturers, uh, how they're using 3D printing. And this right here is about Porsche. Uh, they said that the use of 3D printing has allowed the company to move towards on-demand printing, allowing for far lower costs associated with materials, transportation, and storage. And this is not only beneficial, uh, this is also beneficial as these parts are not in greater demand, and are often expensive to keep in constant production. So Forge has most famously been working with Mark Forge on yeah, reviving Mark these classic parts. <laughs> I am pretty sure that that's actually how it was spelled. So so don't at me. But uh, Forge. <laughs> as a matter of fact, yeah. Wait here. I, I will. I will. I will show my work. Boom. Yeah. Work is shown. But yeah, that that makes a uh, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So that's. That's the thing that, that 3D printing really excels at, right? When you can you can cut costs with products at scale, you know, you see it all the time. You you can make a thousand of something and it's much cheaper than making just one. Yeah. Um, but that's the thing with 3D printing excels at is, you know, you the the printer always is gonna cost the same. You you have the printer, um, but you can make parts as you want. You don't have to make expensive like master molds that you would for all these other mm. you know products that if you want to make one you you've got a lot of upfront cost with with 3d printing you don't so i think definitely customization is one of like the biggest things that you know it's it's really useful for and like they also mentioned storage you you now don't have to pay for such a big warehouse to store all these parts that are just sitting there you know in hopes that a buyer comes along being able to produce something, you know, custom on demand where, where it's needed. Yeah. Makes 3d printing a really solid choice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, what, what I've always found, uh, surprising, I guess, in the world of 3d printing is that, uh, Jay Leno is actually, was, was one of the, I have, to, I, I kind of got to give him credit for this was one of the big <laughs> drivers of, uh, of using 3d printing for classic car stuff. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. Jay Leno is who hosted the tonight show before Jimmy Fallon. Johnny Carson, who I mentioned earlier is who hosted that show before Jay Leno. <laughs> Prior. Got it. Jack mm -hmm. Parr. Okay. No one cares. <laughs> All right. But at any rate, so, um, but, uh, Jay Leno, after he quit the tonight show, he got super into, he's like, Oh, look at this. It's a giant stack of money. I like old cars. It's I will, car garage. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm going to build like the biggest garage ever and have all the cars in it. And uh, a part of that is since he had a lot of rare cars is uh, he you know, would be missing a window crank or whatever. And where are you going to get one of those for a 1908, you know, or 1920 Ford two door or something like that? You know, like you're not. Uh, yeah. So and, and that's another thing when I when I back when I worked with this 3D printing company, you know, we had people that that were specifically restoration experts. So you can go in there with. You know, if you're willing to do the time to do the cleanup, do a you know a 3D scan and get something to custom fit this one part that yeah. you know wouldn't wouldn't make sense for you know how how many buyers do you have for this one part? Right. Um, but being able to replace something, reproduce something, repair like it, it's a very cool process. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, so two things. One, before Jack Parr, I'm pretty sure there wasn't anybody. I think Jack mm -hmm. Parr was the first host of the Tonight Show, and I want to say it was like in the 50s. It was either in the 50s or the 40s. It was a long, long time ago. Uh, but at any rate, and the second thing I wanted to ask or, or say or whatever is, um, I forgot it. Oh my goodness. Oh. <laughs> um, we were talking about classic cars um, classic and, cars. you know, replacing the parts. <laughs> so do you scanning. feel, huh? 3D scanning. I'm trying to jog oh, your memory. That here. was it. No, you did it. You were well done. Okay, 3D scanning. Okay, so on the subject of 3D scanning, I got a question for you. I have literally, I've tried to do it a couple of times and, and ad admittedly it was with my phone or some other crappy way to do it. Have you ever had a 3D scan actually end up usable? 
So the thing about 3D scanning is I feel like there is there's this disconnect because 3D scanning is not it's not a cheat. It's not an easier way to do something. Okay. Um, 3D scanning almost always involves a lot of cleanup work. So you're going to you're going to scan your object. You still have to go through and, you know, touch up colors or, you know, remove background stuff and any distortions. Um, almost always, hey, yes, this is the atom syringe on my wall. It lights up when I put a battery in it. It's, thank it's you really for cool. noticing. <laughs> it is really but, cool in real life. Thank you. It's it's made out of an old gas pump. It's nice and heavy. It's got a lot of weight in there, you know, hair gel bottle. But I digress. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> life so, lesson so is, is in love scanning. with your wall. Go yeah. Ahead. So 3D scanning is is, you know, it's it's a process in itself. I mean, you, you're going to scan the object. It's you're still going to have to double check, you know, your measurements and scale stuff up and, you know, adjust. There, there's still a lot of post work. And I think that's what gets missed with scanning. Um, for a lot of objects for me, it makes a lot more sense to scan stuff uh, or to just build stuff by hand. I do a lot of parametric modeling stuff with, you know, hard edges and measurable lines. Mm-hmm. I think if I were to do 3D scanning, it'd probably be for something organic. You know, it'd be a, you know, I'm going to scan myself and model a piece of armor over that because, you know, how am I going to get all these fine measurements on, you know, my body and my scale? Um, and then also there's there's the the question that I've I've kind of wondered is when people are asking about 3D printing, they're like, oh, so can, you know, I, I scan and make this. And most of the time it's, well, why would you want to? That thing exists. What what are what is the purpose around this? And would you be better off, you know, making some measurements and building that that addition, or would would it be more beneficial to scan? So it's it's pick and you know pick and choose what works best for your application. Yeah. So uh, just to to recap for uh, life's lesson here, uh, we are talking right now about uh, 3D printers in general. Uh, specifically, we're going to get around to 3D printing using VHS tape, which is really crazy. <laughs> Um, but, uh, that's a good point. Scanning might be able to scan and then change to fit something it doesn't fit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so is that, so I, I guess that, that makes a lot more sense. The scanning a person and then using that to make armor for cosplay, for example, or something like that. Um, yeah, for me, it's always made a lot more sense for, for organic shapes, stuff that, you know, I can't, I can't easily take some calipers to and know that that's exactly the shape I'm going to get. It's stuff with variants. That's it, it's much nicer to be able to have all those fine details come through. Oh well, hey, and thank you so much, Crux, for the uh, for the cheer. You got a you got a hundred uh, you got a hundred cheer cheer points for uh, <laughs> for the uh, for scanning all the things. I have an iPhone six case that I like, but I have an iPhone seven scan and change. So it, yeah, that's that actually, that actually is a that actually that is a good question. It, is a use case like that? something that you see as a good use for a 3d scanner um well it depends for me i've i've done a few different you you can't see it on the camera here but hanging right above me i have a little holder that i can put my phone if i want to take a top-down video here nice. um but something like that it it depends on the application i think my phone is very very geometrically shaped that i can you know measure off some corners i can get a measurement for how far the buttons are and you know usually roughly estimate the curvature of the corners. Mm -hmm. Um, So for me, I'm a lot more familiar with parametric modeling. Um, But, you know, that might not be the, uh, yes, I did 3D print the holder. (laughs) But um, yeah, I I designed the model, 3D printed the holder. But for someone else that that might be more familiar with even like sculpt-based modeling, um, Mm -hmm. it might be more beneficial to scan it if they had that kind of equipment available. Yeah. Yeah, and, and if nothing else, just so you know the the approximate size of the phone, like we were talking about before, you know, the same way you would do that with uh, with with cosplay armor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. I yeah, gotta so look it's, at it like it's not it's not an all in one solution. I think I think the thing with even just three D printing in general, mm-hmm. it is a tool. What what is the application where that tool is important? Oh yeah, yeah. You know, in fact, that was one thing that I always thought would would be cool, and I and I I'm sure that this is going to be more of a thing at some point. But I was really looking forward to like augmented reality, like when the Hololens oh, yeah. started coming out, because I was at the time I was into like small motorcycles, like the uh, like the Honda Grom, and what I wanted to do was scan the bike in, and then I'd have it in 3D virtual space, right, and then throw on some virtual goggles and do 3D modeling of a part, like a 
like a, I don't know, a handlebar mount or, or whatever, right? And then take that thing that I made in virtual space and save it as an STL and 3D print it. Which I will say, I think in uh, I think in VR, what is the program? I think it's called like Sculpt 3D. That that exists. That is the world we are living in now. We're in I think a place. YouTuber that I watched, I think it's a uh, Draw with Jazza, did, did some sculpting in there and then yeah. sent that out into his 3D printer and printed that out and painted it. So very cool. Well, that's badass. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, man, I need a 3D. Uh, I need a VR. Head. Also, we got another question from a uh, life lesson. Can you 3D print PCB? Oh, here we go. Oh, you, you asked that yeah. question in the not, right place. Yeah, not, not you, you can't 3D print it directly. I know there's like, you know, conductive filaments for, so to say, but that's not something you would want to do. Um, but I kind of in the, the realm of like additive subtractive manufacturing, I think CNC is usually the way to go. Mm -hmm. So CNC it's computer numeric control, just like, just like a 3D printer is, but instead of adding material, you're, you're routing stuff away. And so people see and see PCBs all the time. Um, I think I've seen people try to laser etch it um, with, you know, a laser engraver and then, you know, chemical etching. Oh, wow. Did, how did it, did it turn out okay or no? Yeah, uh, yeah. I think chemical etching is the standard way to do things. Um, oh, I thought, but, you you know, meant, I thought you meant like, like on a 3D printed thing, you would, you would. <sighs> No, I mean, and yeah, it's okay. not something that I've tried, so I can't be, you know, yeah. certain of what could work. I'm sure that with enough ingenuity, you know, you can 3D print a, a thing and have some channels and, you know, fill it with material and, you know, anything's possible. But from what I've seen, it's it's not going to be realistically your best option. Right, right. Chemical is how they mostly do the connections for all PCB. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you can also route it out, you know, get a, get a router or not a router, but like a CNC machine, like you were saying earlier and just take away what you don't want. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And I think also just to touch on, you know, knowing about 3d printing. So 3d printing as, as a basic, it's just, it's a CNC controlled hot glue gun. So you're always just adding material. Um, primarily what we're used to is seeing filament based printers. You have a spool of plastic going to heat that up and it's going to start building it up layer by layer. 3D printing is just 2D printing in layers. Yeah. Um, and then you get a little bit more advanced with different materials and styles of printers as in the technology it uses. So you'll have a resin based where it's curing resin layer by layer mm -hmm. um, or, you know, you're fusing powder together, but it's all, all layer by layer of, you know, singular layers of adding material. Absolutely. So one thing that I, that I've wondered, oh, next 4D printing now with smell. There you go. 4D printing. <laughs> well, 3D printing has smells already. So we're going to have to kick it up a notch. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. You're going to show, you're going to, you're going to have your print show over time. So, I mean, there are printers that make PC boards, but it's more inject and not 3D print. Interesting. Scratch and sniff. There you go. <laughs> So one thing that I've, that I always have, uh, been a little bit, uh, you know, somewhat mystified and eh, mystified is a little strong, but would 3d printing. So now how in the world I get, I get with the metal, right? You, you're actually printing a powder and then you take that powder and you bake it and you, you make it really hot, fuse this together. It's called centering. We love it. We love to see it folks, but 3d printing with wood. How the heck does that work? Like life lesson says. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, Yep. It works in in very less mystifying ways. So so typically stuff like like wood filaments are are really just wood particulates mixed with uh, polymer particulates. So you you're still there's a you're not printing with solid wood. You're printing with primarily your your plastic base that has wood particles in it. Um, it's you know you'll have a definitely a different feel. You have a very nice texture on it. I've noticed that. Uh -oh. is you kind of hide those lines a little bit because you've got all these inconsistencies and grain and it's pretty nice sand it um do what you want um but it but that's most of when you see different materials that that wouldn't necessarily be meltable in in a 3d printer is you're putting an, a certain amount of powder in there um that's the issue with conductive filaments like one of the things i wanted to do is oh i can print something and you can i, I can either hook it up to some sort of like makey makey and like start playing music on it by touching it mm -hmm. or, you know, maybe electroplate it. Um, but you're not getting solid copper or whatever that material is. You're, you're getting a mix. It's, it's particles kind of branched inside. 
Yeah. So, so it's like particle board. It's, it's M yeah. the plastic MDF of, of 3d printing. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. So that, I guess that is a good way to look at it. It's kind of like, you know, in your hot glue gun analogy, it's kind of like if yeah. you mix sawdust in with that, with the hot glue, it's your, it's your glitter, hot, hot glue stick. <laughs> glitter, hot glue stick. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. But so, what I will say is that what people don't don't realize when they're printing with with particle filled materials like this. So let's say you're printing with there's metal particle fill, um, there's wood fill, um, even even um, just glow in the dark stuff. That the different particles can be abrasive and will you know slowly over time wear out your nozzle. And also when you have stuff like that, you can't go so fine in your 3D printing because now you you greatly increase the chance that you're going to clog that and not be able to extrude material out. Okay, so uh, all jokes aside, uh, so th so the big danger with wood, wood 3D printing is is since there's chunks in it, it could clog your nozzle. Yeah, exactly. No one likes a clogged nozzle. Yeah, you either clog your nozzle or you're you're now widening the hole of the nozzle. So if you've Nozzles all have different different sizes depending on how how wide how tall you want to print. Hmm. Um, but yeah, if you have a 0.4 nozzle and you start feeding in a material and wide it out to 0.6, your software's still telling it it's 0.4. Your prints might not come out exactly as intended. Oh yeah, oh that's a good point. Yeah, you would lose you would lose a lot of your tolerance tolerances yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So 3D uh, printing is is really cool, but it has its little little quirks. So you find that out along the way. I I certainly have seen a lot of quirks. I'm not necessarily certain I figured them out by any means, but, uh, you know, Hey, uh, so Titans asks, is it worth buying a hardened nozzle? How about the Ruby ones? It, it really depends on, on the brand, on the materials. Um, so I've seen a lot of hardened nozzles that, you know, will we'll be make something like a, like a hardened, like steel material or something. And the, the beauty that you have with brass is that the, like the, um, the heat transference is is so good. You're, you're going to have it pretty consistent with brass. You switch to something like a hardened nozzle, you might have some temperature issues just because it's it's not going to heat as evenly. Um, and I think that's what the uh, the Olsen Ruby does is they have a brass nozzle with a a ruby tip. It's it's pretty expensive. I think it's like a hundred bucks for this nozzle. Um, but in theory, you know, it's got that. Um, like lab made Ruby at the end. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's not going to wear down. So if, if you are printing constantly in abrasive materials, maybe that's right for you. Okay. Yeah. So it, well, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe but even if you're like... printing in something like carbon fiber and trying to also get that out of a, out of a, uh, like a hardened steel, not as heat transferring, um, nozzle might not work. So mm. pick and choose. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I guess really that is what it is. Ultimately, it's it's uh, horses, you know, different horses for different courses, as they say. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't you don't really want a a, a a you know a horse that's meant to pull pull a cart in a in a uh, you know dressage event, you know, like doing the the cantering and all that stuff. But at the same time, you don't want one of the fancy horses trying to pull your beer cart. Yeah, exactly. And like three D printing has just gotten so much more accessible. You know, there's a lot of different setups. Yeah. You can definitely take the time and pick what's going to work for you. Like for me, I, I have some stuff that's like glitter filled and, you know, I might get something glow in the dark. Yeah. Um, but for me, I, if I do that so infrequently, I can just buy a new nozzle for, you know, five, $10 and call it good. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So uh, let's see. He says, uh, oh, life's lesson says it sounds like soldering irons to me. This tip, that tip. I just say, screw it. I'm using this one tip for everything. I get your point. <laughs> But there really is a good use for di for the different ones. Uh, are the nozzles easy to switch? Asks Life's Lessons. What say you, Forge? Um, it depends on your printer. So something like my printer, it's all all exposed, very um, just just a frame with um, with a nozzle on it, so I can go in there and remove it. I know other machines make it very difficult, um, especially if you have something with two nozzles and are doing dual extrusion. Mm -hmm. Now you've got to go back in and make sure it's aligned. You're going to have, if you touch it, you're going to have to make sure your heights are correct. So there is some, some hands-on with operating and, you know, maintaining a machine. Um, but for the most part, it, it typically isn't too difficult. And I will say that I have a couple, I have a range of different nozzles from like 0.2 to 0.8, mm -hmm. um, 0.8 millimeters. Yeah. Uh, but I keep a 0.4 on there, brass 0.4, all times, everything I'm doing when I'm printing something small or something big. Yeah. 
Yeah. Unless I'm doing something really, really tiny. Like I, uh, I made some wax seal like stamps with my 3d printer mm -hmm. and I wanted that to be you know, really smooth, really fine switch to a tiny nozzle for that increase the print time by about four times, but Ooh. yeah. Okay. So it's, it, it's kind of like, uh, the smaller you go, the better the resolution, but you're going to have to make more passes because they're smaller nozzles. Yeah. You, but... you've, you've now decreased the, the size of the layers ideally. And you know, now you've got four times as many layers to do in the, in the same amount of uh, space. Uh, let's see. It sounds like way too much work. I would just make one that has 20, uh, 20 tip holder that automatically switches between the tips for the needed input automatically. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, well, if we want to get deeper into the topic of 3d printing, um, one of the cool, uh, so, um, this would be a, you know, research on your own time, but the tool changer is a very interesting, uh, concept. I've, I've gotten to see someone that, that put one together at, believe it was layer one, you know, almost a year ago. Thank you, COVID. <laughs> but um, but it, it's basically a device where the head would go over and switch off to pick up a different one and then mm -hmm. continue printing with that and then, you know, grab the next one. So yeah. it's great if you want to swap, you know, materials or swap nozzle sizes. You can do all but that yeah. automatically. Yeah, for the most part, like I, I am getting into a lot of technicality. There's a lot of specifics. You can you can change nozzles, you can change materials, you can heat the bed. Um, but for the most part, if you just want a part printed, there is a very, very simple, basic way to do that. You can definitely get a printer, get it, get it uh homed and you know, leveled mm -hmm. and you know, tell it to go. Wow. So all all of these uh, all of these different things that you can do with it are optional based on what crazy thing you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, totally. Wow. Well, well, speaking of trying to accomplish things, we have already accomplished the top of the hour somehow. Wow. Like, I, I know we're barely out of our first topic. I think there's going to be, this is going to be a heck of a post game here. Uh, yeah. Well, but, I mean, we, we've got a, we've got a lot of, a lot of interaction with the chat. So, you know, I love seeing this. I love being able to, you know, answer the questions that people have. So I'm glad we're being entertaining. You love to see it. Oh, there are more topics. We're about to print with VHS tape next. If you thought the other stuff was good, you just, you just, you wait. And thank you for the, uh, for the extra chats there, Zenify. We appreciate it. Let's get some chats going on in the chats. Uh, whose idea was this stream? I mean, you know, if it wasn't for Forge, I'd just be some guy that doesn't know things. So, you know, uh, so we really appreciate having Forge here. And another thing that we appreciate is having all of you here. Again, this is on behalf of the Sin Shop. Uh, you can go to sinshop.org for more information about the shop. Uh, we are a uh, hacker slash maker space located in the Las Vegas Valley area. And uh, oh, I, we can actually say proper uh, Las Vegas now. Uh, this, mm -hmm. uh, this stream starts, well, you, well, number one, you're watching it. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but the stream starts at 7.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. And uh, we go all the way to, uh, to uh, 9.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific time as well. And also, while I'm on the subject, we do have a Monday night uh, project stream uh, where me typically Crux, but I think uh, we might have Forge on before too long at some point. I'm not promising anything right now, uh, but uh, where basically we just work on projects for a couple hours. And it's great. You can watch, you can talk, we can chat, blah, blah, blah. It's awesome. So come check it out. Sinshop.org for more info, info about the shop. And if you want to know more about upcoming events, including virtual ones just like this one, you can go to meetup.com forward slash Sinshop. Okay, so now the main event, which was you know supposed to be in the first part, uh, but the uh, the Hackaday article. Now there was an article yep. for Hack Hack Hackaday. I don't know what I'm why I'm saying it like that. There's an article from Hackaday where a guy is printing with VHS tape filament. I saw this. I was like, huh? What? It turns out that uh, this what this guy does is he's oh uh. uh Pong, it's sounding like you built that teleprompter. No, I did not. Most of that was ad lib. <laughs> he he's done this enough times. He is he is yeah. an expert in his field. Wait, wait, wait. We are coming up. Are we how far? We're like, are we a month from our anniversary? Wow. It was like the first week of February, wasn't it? I got I gotta look again. <laughs> R.I.P. all those VHSs that died. <laughs> yeah. So so well here, I'll, what's really gonna cook your noodle <laughs> is that it's actually <laughs> Uh, what's really going to cook your noodle is that it's actually, uh, number one, the prints are magnetic and they have very high tolerances and I'm not quite sure why. So this, this, uh, this guy here now, uh, drops it, finds it stuck to the fridge. I mean, yeah, actually. <laughs> so 
the uh, the the cool thing with this is uh, well, so number one, the video is entirely in in Russian, so that's why I've got the uh, the uh, uh-huh. subtitles on there. Uh, but what this guy did is he figured out how many uh, how many layers of VHS tape that he had to use. It turned out to be ten, by the way, if you're playing the home. Okay. Game. <laughs> and he fed it through a. I'm probably gonna get this wrong, so you know if I'm wrong, which I probably am. Uh, uh, you know, l- tell me the right way to say this. But that right there that we just saw is a PET filament extruder. It looks like a hot end for a, for a printer to me. Just someone took a hot end off the printer, you know, heated that up and is pulling it through. Oh, okay. But I mean, that's essentially what you're doing. You're extruding filament. So is it just that easy, like, to, to, to like, reclaim filament? Like, if you're doing it from, like, recycled <laughs> filament? Um, I'm, I would say mostly no. <laughs> okay. So the thing about um, about 3D printing with filament is there are, there are good filaments, there are bad filaments. Um, and what you really want, so you really want consistency. Um, so something like this, I'm, I'm sure that having all those tapes that are a very uniform and consistent width um, help it in making something that's very printable. Um, but you're also working with, you know, the chemical properties of the material. So I don't know what the base material of, of VHS tape is. Um, but the most common thing you see in 3D printing is um, PLA, which is, you know, it's a corn-based plastic. Um, it's very standard, prints at a relatively low temperature, mm-hmm. about 215C. It's very standard, about every every fill, uh, machine you can can do it. Everything above PLA is going to be kind of advanced. So stuff like ABS and nylons, blah, blah, blah. Um, but when it comes to reusing filament like that, you've, you've already got something that's been heated up and cooled um, and is typically, it's now more brittle. So when people talk a lot about recycling filaments, um, you have to acknowledge that you've already changed the chemical structure of the plastic um, for th- yeah, in theory, you know, it's you think, oh, I'm going to take all my failed prints, grind them down, and just remelt them. Right. Um, but the filament is no longer the same. When when 3D printing filament gets recycled, like at an industrial level, you are adding a large percentage of virgin material to that. Yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you always think of that as as oh yeah like 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 you were saying earlier I'll just dump this into a big bin and all that because I who's that guy mm-hmm. Dave Hawkins I think it was he uh he well first of all earlier this year he changed his YouTube channel name to One Army uh, but he used to have this thing called Precious Plastic where he would show you how to use uh uh you know these different homemade machines to grind it up and then mm-hmm. make it into uh, uh make your own uh 3D filament and uh, and it was interesting, uh, and I kind of wanted to do it for a while, but so, but I never really thought about the concept that, that you just brought up, because the mm-hmm. same thing, and I don't know why, because the same thing applies in metalworking, right? Ah. You can do what's called overworking metal, right? So if you, mm-hmm. uh, um, if you grind on uh, uh, something like a, like a tool or a piece of metal for a long time, it becomes what's called work-hardened, where ah. um, you know, hardening is the thing that metal goes through. It's basically... It, it makes the, the material harder, but it also makes it more brittle. I could go into the metallurgy yeah. of it, but it, whatever, that's not the point. But my point is that it's the same basic idea there. You are changing the chemical structure of the metal exactly the same way as you're changing the chemical structure of the of the 3D printer. Oh printing. man, I was just lost in that video with the uh, going through the calipers. It was fairly consistent. <laughs> that, well, the, see, that's what really surprised me, is that even mm-hmm. though it's reused you know, a VHS tape that he had, let's see, he had tolerances uh, that were a couple hundredths, plus or minus a couple hundredths of a millimeter. Which is, which is pretty standard. And, you know, the film, when you're buying film and that's what you want. Mm. Um, Yeah. I guess it's just a matter of, you know, you have so many strands and you're, you're pulling them through at the exact same rate. There's not going to be a lot of inconsistency in that. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. I guess that makes sense. Like if you're, if you pull it through a little faster, it's going to be thinner. If you pull it slower, it's going to be a little thicker. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, am I going to do this? Probably not. I mean, no. I don't I don't even think I own VHS tapes anymore. <laughs> I think but, I own um, one, and there's no way I'd record over it. If you were to yeah. melt it all down to a liquid form, all of it wouldn't, all of it, wouldn't the chemical bonds reform? Well, there's a question. I mean, that's not something that I've necessarily done, um, actually. Let me let me dig through my uh, my drawer here. Uh-oh. 
because I, I do I do have uh, various ways of applying my my 3D printing junk. So I've definitely melted stuff down and it doesn't get to a pure liquid state. But if I go mm -hmm. much hotter, you you also if you go hotter, you you risk carbonizing the material, which even when you're printing carbonizing material could be a problem for, you know, clogging your hot end. And now you've got soot and other material burning off. So I don't think it's necessarily possible to get there, um, but I also don't have the big heavy machinery that makes filament from scratch. Mm. Um, but just like you said, there's you know you change the structure when you've you've already heated something and cooled it down. Now it's it's going to behave a little differently, yeah. just like in metal. Um, but there's also you know people think okay, well you know I can't do this. You know I'll just send my stuff. You know why is there a company that's going to recycle these for me? Um, and then now you've got another logistical problem of, are you printing with all of the same type of filament from the same brand with the same chemical properties? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, most people, you know, I, even, even with all my PLA, I have a variety of different brands that have all slightly different, like chemical compounds of how they make the material. So I can't just lump that together and be like, okay, I'm going to re-extrude this and make a new filament. Yeah. Because it's not going to work at those same temperatures. Um, it's not so like like what Crux, Crux just said in the chat, also making your own filament is very difficult to get good quality. I mean, that kind of goes in line with uh, with what you're saying, because, uh, you know, if you if you just take, you know, this is a 3D print I had last week. I'm going to throw that in the bin and here's a milk jug and here's something from an orange juice, you know, container or whatever, you know, then all of that together like it's just going to be a mishmash at some points it's going to be more orange juice jug at some point it's going to be more milk jug at some point it's going to be more cutting board you know what i mean like yeah you're going to have all those different materials lumped in there it's not going to be a a mix of all of it so that's yeah hmm. and it's not to say that it's it's impossible there are, there are definitely you know um i think the the philostruder is like an at home kind of machine to to extrude your own filament um, but getting getting the same quality that you're expecting from, you know, something made out of virgin material mm -hmm. um, versus something that, you know, is made from a mix of old and new material is going to be very different. Like you you run into the issues of of the chemical makeup, um, but also, you know, the consistency with with the thickness of the material. Um, and yeah, there, there's just the variations of that. And if we've learned anything from trying to recycle any sort of plastic is that it's unfortunately not like a cost benefit thing. There's not a whole lot of incentive right now for people to be doing it, which, you know, kind of sucks. Um, but because of that, because of 3D printing and inherently the waste it produces, I think a lot of people have moved more towards um, PETG as a standard material, which mm. I think is a... Uh, is a more recyclable plastic if i'm correct but yeah there's yeah. there's a lot there's a lot more to go with with how we're going to combat the uh, the plastic use um and mm. you know i'm excited to see what's possible but right now there are some real limitations and yeah there's so somebody, only time will tell how we combat them yeah so we had we had we did have a couple of questions in the chat i didn't have the chat on that on that screen there but uh he says uh, you're melting all the materials this is life's lesson again he says, uh, you're melting all the materials. Wouldn't they combine into a single chemical structure? Wouldn't it? I don't necessarily think it would. I mean, uh, you're the, you're the expert. Go for it. Oh, I am. I mean, I am definitely not a chemical scientist, so I, I, <laughs> Relative I can't to me, be sure how those are. bonds form. Um, the, the most I can say is, you know, I, I assume that someone out there has tried it. Yeah. Uh, it is not somewhere that, that I've seen where they're yet. <laughs> life's lesson again says uh print everything with spaghetti so you can eat it after there you go we're gonna solve the world world uh uh the world hunger problem here uh you're talking... if you've ever had a, a failed 3d print and something knocked down and just filament spewing out you you have made 3d printed oh, spaghetti God. yeah it was a mess and it was going while i was at work too like the whole eight hours worth of just just slop it was not pretty it was all dangling off the end of my th of my uh of my print head too. It was just like sad. It was just like this sad marionette going back and forth. Oh, no. Yeah. Uh, oh, I've so had some glorious globs of shame in my day. So <laughs> absolutely. Uh, Titan says, uh, I wonder if it could be done with a large printer uh, that would require less consistency. 
Mm-hmm. And I've I've seen that done. Usually people that are making, you know, some sort of recycle rig at home yeah. have used something like a like a nozzle to try to get that consistent size. I mean, you're still playing with things like, you know, how gravity is going to affect how you're which direction you're pulling and spooling onto the material. Mm-hmm. You're going to have inconsistencies. It's just, you know, it's it's part of living in a world that has physics. Thank um, you, physics. Yeah, so, but there there are ways that, like, like I said, I, I'm pretty sure it's the the filistrator, which is like a manufactured, you know, off you can buy a part. Yeah. Um, and there are going to be some things that have been tweaked and tested out. I think if if that's something you're interested in trying to tackle, there there are a ton of places on the internet that have much more resources than I do. <laughs> My guess is that it would be, you know, like even if you put aside whether or not it would actually work. If you put even if you put that aside, I I would bet dollars to donuts that you're gonna do it once or twice, and then from that moment forward, you're gonna be like, eh, I don't really feel like feeding the machine today. I'm just gonna just gonna buy it. I can have it delivered tomorrow. You know, it's fine. I'll just buy a ream or buy a roll. I that's that's what I would do. Uh, he's not answering. I just yelled at him in text. Okay, well, <laughs> well, I'm sure your friend. You know, have your friend watch the videos. Uh, but yeah, no, uh, and you know, don't forget to like and subscribe and all that. Okay. So at any rate, uh, let's see what time we got. We only have 10 minutes left. Do we want to talk about how 3d printers could be bad for your health or do you want to go back? We want to keep stay on, on VHS. We want to do VHS. I mean, I mean, we can, uh, we can go anywhere here. I you mean, know, I've, I've, <laughs> yeah, let's, let's barrel through. We're, we're, we're just gonna, okay, we're gonna go it. for it. Okay. So I, another article that I found, uh, was, uh, 3d printers may be bad for your health dun, dun, dun. now to me <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Huffing 3D my, my air piano <laughs> is great oh uh oh titans is asking uh any major changes in the 3d printing industry in the last year um well in the last year i have not been attending any trade shows because obviously the world is on fire mm. um so I'm not familiar with with too much that has has widely changed. I mean, I know that year over year, like companies and you know industrial manufacturing is is now very seriously looking and adopting three D printing. Mm-hmm. And you know, I think for a lot of those reasons, like apply to someone like like me or the general home user. It's you know being able to go ahead and and print something out very very quickly, very cheaply. You know, a one off part be able to see it, hold it, measure it, test it out, you know, print out the next version of that, mm-hmm. which I think if you just scale up into industrial manufacturing is you get to print your part before you spent hundreds of thousands of dollars sending it to some, you know, other company to manufacture it for you only to find out it's wrong. Yeah. So yeah, that would be the prototype usage. Like we were talking about earlier with Ford and Porsche and all that. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the University of, oh, damn it. Oh, Georgia Tech. That's where it was, not University. Georgia Tech. There was a research team. And they were like, hey, all this 3D printing stuff. I wonder if we if we are inhaling it. Is that a bad thing? Well, there was research that indicated maybe. Uh, in, uh, in their research, the team found that generally the hotter the temperature required to melt the filament, the more emissions 3D printers produced. As a result, I should have rehearsed that one. Plastic filaments, which re- <laughs> require Just a ABS, higher temperature. ABS plastic. <laughs> do, you, do you know how to like say the whole word? Acrylonitrobutadiene uh, no. styrene. That's, that's, that's as close as I'm getting. All right, anyway. Um, ABS plastic, uh, which require a higher temperature to melt, produced more emissions than fil- filaments made of polyactic, polylactic acid, PLA, which melt at a lower temperature. That doesn't answer the question. I'm not sure what the question was. So, so um, in the 3D printing industry, we've known that ABS is is more harmful than PLA. Okay. Um, typically, ABS you're going to be printing in something that's you know a heated chamber, enclosed, ideally you know somewhere you can vent outside. Mm-hmm. Um, PLA is a corn-based plastic, a little safer. Makes some smells like you know. It, it smells like maple syrup sometimes. It's a great time. Hmm. Um, but even even something like that, you know, you're going to walk into a room that's 3D printing and you're going to smell something and realize, oh, is this bad for me? Yeah. And it, it's all a matter of, you know, what, what chemicals you're going to be printing with and, you know, what are the properties when you heat it up? Because even something like a, like a 
backyard camping like campfire burning wood is is carcinogenic right. um you're changing something you're heating it up and changing the state right. what what are the risks that you're going to have yeah um, so something like ABS, you know, you you want to take a bit more precaution, you know, stuff like ABS when you print with it isn't something that's food safe, like PLA is, which is a whole other realm of what is safe mm -hmm. for 3D printing, because 3D printing has a bunch of lines. And if you are going to be using it for like food or, you know, yep. some sort of like medical purpose, you, you've now have all these lines that can collect bacteria and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, just in the terms of the material. You know, ABS is something that's not going to be as as safe for you as a a harmful like a fume situation. Mm -hmm. um, if you're trying to print, which I don't know why it exists, um, but something like PVC is is oh, a God. filament that I've seen. And you know, if you're you, you can make chlorine gas, which is not not only like not machine safe, but also not human safe. Yeah, I don't even understand why PVC is a thing. Why would you Why would you make it out of PVC? I mean, if I mean, it, it's it's used in a variety of industries, like obviously PVC like pipes and tubing exist. Yeah. If you're going to be printing with something like that, you've got a specific machine that is designed and vented for it. Yeah. So, I mean, there are, there are applications, but it's it's definitely what what is the material you're printing with and understand the risks that come with it. Like I said, when you're getting started, when you're getting started with PLA, which is, you know, very standard setting, low temperature, easy to print with. Mm -hmm. um, you're not really going to be facing a lot of difficulty or risks if you're jumping up to something like like ABS. Um, you, you should research in not only because you have to have certain settings to make it print, you got to have like a nice heated bed and, you know, a higher temperature. Um, but yeah, the, the material properties get get a little little. Dif um, how how do I how do I words? Yeah, the <laughs> material properties change with with the different products. Yeah. And if you're you're switching up, you're usually switching for a reason. You're usually switching for a certain property out of it. Mm -hmm. So I would hope that when you're buying it along the way, they tell you what to expect. Yeah, yeah. I guess really that is ultimately what you, uh, you what what the manufacturer should do in order to do it responsibly is you know just like provide. I guess what was that the MSDS or you know, yeah material yeah. safety data sheets. There you go. Indeed. <laughs> So now the article did say that the fumes create a toxic response, but they did not, uh, but that the amount toxic that they were response. <laughs> one, they didn't ref define a toxic response in the article. And two, uh, it did not actually reflect actual exposures. So I think that they were like, here, we're going to throw all this stuff in, in there and, you know, blah, blah, blah. In a lab setting, you know, with perfect conditions and a meter right up next to it, this is what we're getting. In the state of California. Yeah, exactly. Now, they did have uh, some recommendations. What they said was uh, operate 3D printers only in well-ventilated areas. Duh. Uh, setting the nozzle them. temperature at the lower end of the temperature range for filament materials. Uh, just like Life's Lesson said earlier, uh, hotter stuff does indeed make more emissions than colder. So yeah, Don't burn and carbonize things. There you don't go. Don't things on fire. Physics is a thing. Uh, stand away from operating machines and using machines and filament uh, that have been tested and verified to have low emissions. So... There's yeah, that. yeah, I, I agree with that 100%. Um, I even think so there's a lot of machines, um, especially in like the commercial grade or like light industrial prosumer kind of markets yeah. that have stuff like a like a HEPA filter built into it. And, and I would say, you know, don't rely on that. Don't don't assume that it can make something that's unsafe, safe. Mm. Okay, but um, but obviously it's going to be something that, you know, if if something is low emissions and, you know, deemed relatively safe, you know, it's just making it better for you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, open the damn window. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah. So like they they also did did point out in the article that uh, that the uh, I think I posted it earlier. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I did. Um, they also said in the article that in a typical office setting where you've got a, a, a good amount of space. Uh, that it's it's not that bad so like the yeah you know, are they like i said at the top of the show are they bad for your health not really yeah but, with mean, with just about <laughs> just about every question that that someone will have on 3d printing the answer is going to be it depends <laughs> that's true and, yeah yeah and that's just the nature of you know they're yeah, the, the reason the 3D printing is really caught on is is that it's super versatile. You can make it do exactly what you want. You know, right. you can build your own printers from scratch, but each each different iteration you're going to make is going to have a different set of consequences. So 
yeah. just trying to think of what do I have? What do I want to get to? What are, you know, the, the risks and the changes I'm going to have to make along the way? What's, what's the right horse for this particular course? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, so, uh, any, any final thoughts on, uh, on the printing? Oh, uh, and Life's Lessons asked, can you 3D print a bow? I don't know what kind of, what kind of bow. What kind of bow? Like a, like a violin bow? Like, <laughs> or is it like the bow a, of a ship? Yeah. But, um, I would say probably there, there are different, like I said, there's a bunch of different materials out there that have a lot of different properties. So if you wanted something to be a little bit flexible, yeah, to be able to shoot an arrow, you, you might have a material for that. Mm -hmm. So reading up on, um, almost everything, I think I buy a lot of my, my filaments from matter hackers. And I think a lot of those, um, filaments have different, different like data values that have been tested for, you know, here's, here's like the flexibility of it, or here's, you know, the temperature range and, you know, what, um, yeah. So I think, uh, if I remember right, ABS has a bit of flexibility to it. Will it be enough for a bow? I'm not sure. Um, there's also you know, getting more technical into this. It's the direction that you're printing in. If you're printing your bow upright and you've got a bunch of your layers are this way. Now your, your area of breakage is along those layers. Mm. So you can pull it back and it'll it'll snap just because that is the weakest point. You know, if you printed it on its side and the layers are this way, when you pull it back, you're pulling along all the layers at the same time. So when we come back, I, I'm going to find some video <laughs> during the break of uh, of the the 45 degree angle printer, the one I showed you in chat, uh, Forge, like uh, uh, what was that, like mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago, something like that, because that yep. kind of goes a little bit to prevent that, if I'm not mistaken, right? Um, belt printers are, are really cool because you can print very long objects. It, it's all going to depend on what your model is. Yeah. It, if your model is, you know, a large, you know, drumstick and you have to print it flat, like printing on a belt is going to be a great way to do that. Yeah. Um, but if you're, you know, printing on a tower, you happen to have like a leaning tower and now you've got all those angles. <laughs> Maybe it's not. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Well, there again, yeah. it depends. Mm -hmm. Just like, yeah, that's. Yeah. That's pretty much the whole episode. 3D printing. Yeah, I can I can tell you a, a good point and a bad point about each of these. It's it's up to you to decide if it's going to be worth it. Ask your doctor if these 3D printers <laughs> are right for you. <laughs> so, all right, to uh, to what life's lesson just said. Oh, it's just a break. It's still going. Hell yeah, woot 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 indeed. So we are going to take a quick break. Uh, we're gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go and exchange uh, my my current beverage for a different beverage, and then uh, we will come back. And we're gonna have the post game now. If you are watching this on YouTube, number one, welcome to Saturday. But number two, in just a very short second after I say goodbye to Forge, we are uh, you're gonna see a, a me with even bigger sideburns telling you to watch the show on Twitch. Uh, we broadcast every well, I'm not gonna say it again because you're gonna hear me say it in just a second. Uh, <laughs> I still want to know what the stuff behind you is looks audio related. I will. I don't know. I don't remember you asking me the first time, but I will tell you about that in the post game. Okay, so. Forge, thank you so much for joining us for the main show. We yeah. super duper appreciate it. You can, you're going to stick around for the post game, right? Yeah. Yeah, excellent. of course. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So Forge on the post game. When we come back, here's the version of me from several months ago. Hi, I'm the mighty Pong host of the show that you just got done watching. Hey, if you'd like to see the entire show and not just the first hour, make sure that you watch on twitch.tv forward slash sin shop every Friday night for the main show. And on Monday nights, we have our special project night. So you can join us, build something, and uh, basically throw stuff at us while we try to concentrate on things. It's a lot of fun. Kind of. But hey, anyway, we hope to see you there. It's a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, so join us over there, twitch.tv forward slash sin shop. I am, of course, the Mighty Pong, and we will see you there. One take. Not one take.